Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. Welcome to this online service from St Mary's Church, Wotton in Bedfordshire on Sunday the 4th of July. My name is Peter Ackroyd. And as those verses from Psalm 95 proclaim, the Lord's people, all who trust in the steadfast love which he showed most fully, completely and gloriously in the Lord Jesus Christ, all the Lord's people can rejoice that he is the Lord of all the earth. That's important for us today here at St Mary's because today is the first day of a week of prayer for our church finances. I'm very grateful that because of your generosity, St Mary's over the years has not been a church which has had to resort to regular appeals or fundraising events to pay our monthly bills. I want to say thank you for your part in that. This year is looking uh, different as some of you may already know because of changes in circumstances, entirely understandably, um, our monthly income in April uh, fell back by about a thousand pounds a month. And that looks as though it's uh, not going to recover quickly. Most of our costs are staff related. And so cutting them quickly is something we are very reluctant uh, to contemplate. And so our reserves are draining away fairly fast at the moment. And that's why we're calling on all members of St Mary's not to put their hands in their pockets now, but to set aside time this week, uh, one with another, to seek the Lord's face in prayer for the needs of the church, to ask him to help us to trust him more and more with all that he has put in our hands, all that the Lord of the earth has put into our hands as individuals, as families, as well as the family of the church. And as he has done so, so generously in the past, through the generosity of his people, to provide for the needs of the church in this year and the years to come. It'll be great to put our finances on a firmer footing again. But the first step, the first step in, in doing that is to come to the Lord and wait on him in prayer. Later today, we'll be sending by email some suggestions of how you can pray this week with some resources for your own times of prayer, in growth groups and with one another. Um, uh, and um, if you can join us uh, daily, Monday to Friday at one o'clock in church. And we begin in earnest at tonight's evening online prayer gathering at quarter past seven. Please make a priority of coming to that. Uh, I'll say a bit more about our situation and how we can pray for it this week. As we prepare to sing our opening song of praise, some more verses from Psalm 95, reminding us of who we are. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the flock under his care.
during our in-church service this morning, our young people will be learning about King David's great prayer of confession in uh, Psalm 51. It arose from a time of great personal uh, failure, moral failure in David's life, devastating moral failure. We heard about it in one of our services in May. And it was when David owned up and admitted the horror of what he had done, not only to others, but to God, that he was able to receive forgiveness and mercy. Our confession this morning is based on his words. We say them together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Our service in church this morning is a communion service. And um, at communion, we often use a form of creed known as the Nicene Creed. And the words are going to come on the screen as we join with those who will be with us in church this morning in uh, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer when we can come to you with anything and everything that is on our minds and hearts, any time, day or night, and know that you will always be listening. God of hope, we pray for our world. We thank you for the success of the vaccines that protect us from the coronavirus. In these times of change, and as restrictions are lifted more and more, we pray for our government and leaders across the world. Please guide them with your wisdom as they make important decisions. Amen. We pray for our church here in Wootton, and as we begin this week of prayer for our church finances, we thank you for your provision to us at St Mary's over the years, and we pray that as a church family, we will be able to prayerfully depend on you, Father. Amen. We pray for our mission partners in Belgium, Jude and YP, and for their children, Jason, Matteo and Anastasia. Thank you for the good work they are doing to share the gospel there. We give thanks that they were able to have a youth barbecue recently where some of the young people were able to come together. We pray that the church they have planted will grow and more people will come to know Jesus as their saviour. We especially pray for Jason and Matteo this week as they head off to their first camp. Father, we know they long to be able to travel to visit family and friends in the UK and we pray that they will be able to do that safely soon. Amen. Lord, we pray for the planning of our summer holiday club this year. We know this will be different to previous years, but please guide Emma and the team as they plan and that lots of people come forward to help and serve you in this way. Thank you for this opportunity to share your love with the children of Wootton and their families. Help us as a church in our mission of knowing Jesus and making Jesus known to all. Amen. Lord, you taught us to love our neighbour and to care for those in need. We bring to you all those who are struggling with bereavement and ill health, both physically and mentally. May they know your love for them. Please help us to support and care for one another. In a moment of silence, let's bring those people we know to you.
Father, thank you for hearing the prayers on our hearts. May we seek to trust you more and more each day for all things at all times and in all our ways. Thank you for everything that Jesus has done on the cross. Help us to keep reaching out for him through the good times and the bad. Thank you for all the blessings you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold.
Today's reading is from Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. A son honours his father, and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honour due to me? If I am a master, where is the respect due to me, said the Lord Almighty? It is you, priests, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Now plead with God to be gracious to us with such offerings from your hands. Will he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying, the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame or diseased animals and offer them as a sacrifice, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that this morning, by the help of your Holy Spirit, we would hear your word with understanding, receive it with faith, and obey it with courage. Amen. Honesty is healthy and sometimes a bit surprising. I think Sean was a bit surprised last uh, Sunday morning when before the service in the vestry he asked how I was and I replied a bit to my surprise. I feel a bit like a bear with a, with a sore head. It doesn't take much at the moment to make me grumpy. And I suppose I could have said there's a not a there's a bit to be grumpy about. We're waiting, weary of waiting for life to be normal. We're fed up with lockdown, fed up with constantly changing plans. There's a lot uh, that is wearisome at the moment. And frankly, in these situations, we're often tempted to be resentful of God when our circumstances are disappointing or discouraging. The book of Malachi has something to say to our weariness, our inbuilt tendency to bad temper or resentment of hard times, something that is good for us to hear. It's a prophecy to the people of Israel, initially, um, over 400 years before Christ, who were living in wearisome and frustrating times. Their circumstances were very discouraging. It had been decades since they'd returned from 70 years of exile in Babylon to Judah and Jerusalem, and they'd returned full of hope and gratitude, but their expectations have been disappointed. Uh, their territory was a fragment of what it had once been. The rebuilt temple in Jerusalem was nothing like as grand as Solomon's temple had been. They lived as subjects of a foreign empire and in place of a king from the line of David on the throne, they answered to a governor from Persia. Life uh, seemed to be on hold waiting for the fullness, the richness, the abundance of life which uh, the prophets had promised and which seemed so elusive. 
It felt like they were living a half-life. And as Malachi spells out, that's how they were living towards God, in half-hearted discipleship, and the evidence was in plain sight. Apathy and carelessness, going through the motions, but with their hearts elsewhere. And the book of Malachi's question is, what is needed in that situation to deal with half-hearted, weary discipleship? And Malachi's answer is something more than a pep talk, more than a kick in the pants. What they needed, what we need, is to rediscover what we forget and what we come to doubt when circumstances are disappointing and life feels like it's in the waiting room. And we began to hear that message last week, the heart of the message of Malachi, the heart of what we need to remember um, in life and in service, the love of God. I have loved you, says the Lord at the opening of the book. I have loved you. Um, the Lord who passed before Moses on Sinai, expounding his own name in words that ring through the whole Bible after that. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious Lord, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God loves you passionately, says Malachi. His love for you is unstoppable and unchanging, whatever your circumstances suggest. Will you remember this? Uh, central verses of Malachi, perhaps chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. And he's looking back to that proclamation of God's love at the beginning of the book when he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. Because the Lord Almighty is utterly committed to his people. And that's why through Malachi, the Lord enters into dialogue with his own people, calls them, if you like, into his boardroom and reasons with them in the language of exasperated love, the language of a parent who sees a child getting into danger, um, to wake up and uh, shows them the dangers of spiritual apathy and complacency, calls them to rediscover a heart from God by re rediscovering his heart for them. And he does it in a number of stages. In verses 6 to 14, our passage this morning of chapter 1, his camera is turned on the temple in Jerusalem, and especially on the priests, the clergy. People took their lead from their leaders, and it's very difficult for the quality of discipleship of a church to rise above the quality of discipleship of its leaders. So he gives us two overlapping scenes from the temple to open our eyes to how people were treating God, treating the God who relates to his own people as father, and to the nations of the world as creator and king. And to show us that God expects and deserves more from us in response to his love than the half-hearted and sometimes grumpy response and service we sometimes kid ourselves, we can fob him off with. So first, verses six to 10, what they're doing, we see reveals disrespect for God, their loving father. A son honors his father, verse six, and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honour due to me? Says the Lord. Disrespect for God as father. And verse 11 to 14, we'll see dishonour for God, the God whose name will one day be honoured in all the earth. And it's all to do with sacrifices, apparently. Verse seven, you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? Answer comes back, by offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying the Lord's name is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to the governor. Would he be pleased with you? Malachi is saying, you know God deserves the best the pick of the flock, the service that shows that it's God who comes first for us personally and for us as his people. But the animals you bring for sacrifice are the leftovers, the roadkill, the livestock that you weren't gonna keep anyway, the cuts you'd never dare serve to the foreign governor. Here's half-hearted worship. Everything looks like it's in order until you take a closer look. And the people and the priests are going through the motions because their heart is not in it. 
uh, sacrifices are costing them nothing because the name of God has come to mean less and less. That name that stands for his awesome and loving character has been in practice forgotten. And so in verse 10, the Lord says to him, Malachi, shocking thing, you'd be better off shutting the doors of the temple. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. And you only have to turn over a few pages in the Bible to the next chapter, the Gospel of Matthew, to see Jesus finding the same in his day. As he says, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And the God we disrespect when we offer sacrifices that cost nothing uh, and offer a half-hearted service is not some unfeeling, hard taskmaster tyrant. He is the one who loves us passionately. He is our Father in heaven. Why would we do that? But maybe you're asking, what has all this talk of sacrifice to do with me, to, first, to 21st century Christians and New Testament believers? We, after all, don't offer animals in sacrifice on an altar, but receive bread and wine from a table because Jesus became the perfect once for all sacrifice for sin, fulfilling all the sacrifices. And we don't have a temple because his body and then his people have taken place of the temple. We don't have priests as mediators because Jesus is the great high priest. And um, it was Jesus who said that true worshippers will worship uh, not in a place, not in Jerusalem or somewhere else, but in spirit and in truth. So how does this land for us? Well, the New Testament helps us. Uh, so in Romans chapter 1, ch chapter 12, uh, we read this and see how the New Testament takes the language of sacrifice and moves it uh, from out of the temple and into the whole of life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, says the writer, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Because God loved you so much, that he was prepared to see his own son offer himself on the cross as the sacrifice we need for the forgiveness of sins, for eternal life. Because that is the measure of the steadfast love and faithfulness of the Lord Almighty. The greatest measure of it. We live our whole lives in grateful, sacrificial response. That's the pattern of the Christian life. We receive forgiveness as a gift and we respond by giving ourselves in his service, putting God first in the whole of life, living wholeheartedly for him, whatever it costs, taking up our cross. And discipleship always costs time, money, energy, opportunities, promotion, relationships perhaps. And it's when the penny drops all over again about the astonishing breadth and depth and height and width of the love of God in Christ, when I'm unashamed, to admit daily my need of that sacrifice. That's when I'll know that transformation of heart and grumpy half-hearted Christian living, giving God the leftovers, which cost me little, will give way to the freedom and joy of his service and the assurance of his smile. Disrespect for God the loving Father. And then more briefly, verses 11 to 14, dishonour slander for the God who is king of the nations. That's what's going on. Verse 10, verse 11, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations. Malachi's camera here sees the future. The future where people from every nation will be wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord Almighty and will delight to honour his name and serve him. That is the destiny of the universe. And we glimpse it in the worldwide reach of the gospel today. Christian disciples in every nation. What a contrast with the half-hearted and sacrificial resentful service, which is all I'm often prepared to give. What a contrast with the people described in verse 14. The cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. 
the Lord who the Lord tells us won't be fooled by our half-hearted hypocrisy. The one who is a great king and whose name is feared among the nations. Disrespect and dishonor, slander, apathy and half-hearted service. These aren't comfortable words, are they? But they're healthy words when they wake us up. When they reveal to us how much we need over and over again to grasp the grace of God our Father, and the love of God our King. And when the Holy Spirit takes us and takes them and uses them to bring us back into the arms of his love. Times can be discouraging. Circumstances of life are often wearisome. Expectations are sometimes painfully disappointed. But Malachi wants us to know that the Lord Almighty, the great King whose name will be feared among the nations, has set his love unstoppably on his people and that he doesn't change. And when we return to him, we will be renewed in his service, whatever it, co whatever it costs us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name in our thinking, our speaking and our doing this week. Amen. Look forward to seeing many of you at the prayer gathering at quarter past seven tonight on Zoom. The link was on the bulletin um, and is also found on our church website. Do join us there. We'll be finished by eight o'clock, quarter past seven on Zoom this evening. Really important prayer meeting for our church at the beginning of this week. And uh, before that, at half past eleven this morning, there's our regular Zoom coffee uh, link also on the bulletin and on the website. Our closing prayer. Psalm 95 again, the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. May the Lord, from whom all good things come, and who through the death and shame of the cross, secured his people's hope and wealth, bless, preserve and keep us. Make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us, in our homes, our families, and in the family of the church and turn his face towards us 
and give us his peace. Amen.